Hi, welcome to Strain Talk. I'm Monty. I'm Rebecca. And today we are here talking with our Director of Civil Infrastructure, Linda Miller. But first, I uh, just want to let you know that this is going to be an audio only podcast. So we're going to go to audio only in a few minutes. And remember to uh, download um, Train Talk on your iTunes, on Podbean, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find Train Talk. So three, two, one. Good afternoon, Linda. Hey, hello, guys. Thanks for having me today. Thank you for coming on the show. So uh, I guess we'll start off, you know, what is a director of civil infrastructure and what do you do? Yeah, so the uh, the exciting, uh, sexy part of uh, Texas High Speed Rails, of course, the the trains. My our colleague Paul, he calls him the Empress of the of the High Speed <laughs> Railway. So there's that's where all the glamour and glory is. But those trains would be nothing without the civil and infrastructure. So that's all the elevated viaducts that allow the train to fly along uh, at a different grade than the than the people and the vehicles and all passing through. The the train depot facilities, a TMF, a train maintenance facilities and critically important to keeping the trains not just uh, well but but performing spectacularly uh, during the day and and all of the maintenance of way or the all the facilities along the along the alignment along our pathway between here and and Houston uh, making sure that it's that it's always uh, well and, and, and up and running every day that our system is in operation so all of the building of all of that infrastructure excuse me I did not say the operations center uh, which is going to be like a like a NASA uh, you know control center there with the screens and readouts and that all of the building of that great and important structure also falls to me and, and my part of the team. So what is your background then that has brought you to this point in your career? Well, so I've got uh, over 30 years. I, I try not to say 30 years. It makes me sound old, but I did just <laughs> crest 30 years uh, in the construction industry, uh, and I've always been in transportation. So my, my degree is in engineering. Uh, my master's degree I got at UC Berkeley, uh, also in engineering, and I, and I started in the construction industry uh, back in the 1980s and, and have gone from loving uh, big transportation infrastructure projects one after the other, and for the last 15 years have been overseas. So although I was born in the United States and, and participated in a number of big, great big transport infrastructure projects uh, in this country, I then got the chance to go to Europe and, and have been doing mostly rail, uh, mostly all rail jobs there, uh, and including in high-speed rail. And so, uh, and my last, I, I should say, I've just arrived in Texas a few weeks ago where I've been the last two years in Sydney, Australia, doing some incredibly exciting work there, bringing the very first metro transport to Sydney, Australia, which, which desperately needs it, if you know anything about the traffic congestion in that otherwise very, um, very beautiful, very gorgeous city that has got a terrible traffic congestion problem. So the, bring, the bringing of underground rail uh, there has been fantastic. So that was me and my team with tunnel boring machines and, and all that under, under Sydney Harbor. So yeah, I, I feel like a, a lot of my life has led up to the excitement and the chance to be here at the Texas High Speed Rail job. The first, if I'm allowed to say that, that's going to be just so cracking successful uh, back here in back here in my home country. And so you mentioned Europe. I know that you've um, worked previously in England, and um, uh, I hear that you've recently received an honor called the OBE. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what that means? Well, yes, thank you. I I uh, I'd like to be shyer about it, but I'm just busting with pride. It's um. It's a very important uh, award for civilians uh, in Britain. Um, I hate to say most Americans don't know what an IB, what an OBE is. When I described it to my family, they, they thought I'd gone from construction to becoming a, a gynecologist, I, I, it has to be said. Um, but, but it is the, the order of the British Empire, and the award that I received OBE is to be an officer of the British Empire. So it's not knighthood, uh, but it's a short step below knighthood, and I was selected by the Queen, got to go to Buckingham Palace wow. and, and receive this amazing uh, lifetime award. So what projects did you work on? in England to uh, to be considered for an award like that. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. The the biggest project that I've been I spent six years on before heading to Sydney, Australia, is Crossrail. So Crossrail mm -hmm. is 
new tunnels, and, and in particular, I was there as part of the tunnel and railway systems team. Also, I was the project leader for a billion dollar station that's right in the heart of the, the center uh, there near St. Paul's Cathedral uh, for, for Crossrail. So huge undertaking when that system opens. It is gonna add 10% to the rail capability in that huge cosmopolitan area. I would tell you the other thing that's quite similar to, to working here in Texas, a lot, lot, lot of stakeholders close by and a lot of really of people um, that, that you need to listen to and care about along the way, whether they are small shopkeepers or schools along the way or homes and residents and, and being incredibly sensitive to how we build multi, multi-billion dollar uh, transport infrastructure which is needed, which is urgently needed, um, uh, but, but also can be really disruptive to people's lives. And so really listening to people along the way and then really reminding people, including my own team, over and over again of what the end game looks like through many, many long, hard years. I think that, that, that's a, a big takeaway for me. I also worked on the underground and uh, say what you will, underground is the workhorse. Uh, of London. It moves four million people a day, four million wow. people a day, including me there getting on that train, f you know, faithfully with, gosh, uh, many of the systems with two minute headways, four minute headways, thousands and thousands of people being able to get to work, being able to get to, to school, being able to be with their families in a way that could never happen otherwise in, in that huge megalopolis that is greater London uh, without great transport systems. So I'm a super train head. I love trains. I can talk trains all day long uh, uh, to, to anybody that'll listen. Most of my time, I would say, is in construction, um, although I did do some time in design as well. So I have a great respect for this period of time and getting the engineering right, getting the design right, so that when we launch into construction, actually, we have a brilliant shot at, at making it go well. So what, about, what was it about this project that, um, that brought you away from Sydney? What was it about the Texas Central project that, uh, that made you want to come work here? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Well, for more than 20 years, I have waited and watched and hoped for high-speed rail to become a brilliant thing in the United States. As I say, my, my, home, my home turf. Um, and, and it just hasn't happened. And there's a number of reasons why it hasn't happened in, in other cities, but I think everything is poised right here in Texas uh, to, to, to make it right. I, I'm just expressing my own opinion here now, but I think uh, choosing the Japanese technology, the finest technology in the world, even across Europe, though there is great high-speed rail technology in France, in Italy, we're building high-speed too in the UK. I, I, I know we've got great systems. The Japanese is the gold standard across the world in, in unbelievable reliability numbers, unbelievable safety numbers. So there are a lot of advantages then I assume for having your operator uh, brought on early to do some of that integration work on the front end. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so if you're already thinking about customer experience, not just what the journey time is gonna be, but what is the look and feel and, and what is the future of, of how this system is gonna run. What happens if there's a train breakdown? How quickly can you get one out of service? How quickly do you get another one in service? Where do you have them lined up? What are the things that you need to do so that you never have a train go out of service, that you just have that ridiculously high reliability where the Japanese have set such an incredibly high standard uh, in Japan? So what are the things that you're checking, uh, replacing, you know, uh, inspecting, rubbing down, moving around, you know, just all of that that you do ahead of time, ahead of time, ahead of time, so that you have trains that when they fly into service, they're just, uh, you know, brilliant both for the customer and, and for the transport uh, system itself. And you can think that you can do that. You can think that, like me, I think I can do that. But actually, you know, I've said it, my piece is the civil and in infrastructure piece. When you get people that run trains, that put trains out for service every single day and understand that front edge of it and see the world through that prism and that perspective, it's, it's fantastic. And so integrating those now, bringing those together now is a, is a fantastic idea. I think it bodes fantastically well for us.
So I recently had the opportunity to work our informational booth at EarthX here in Dallas with you. And one of the things that I observed as you were working this booth is you were excellent at recruiting uh, Young youngsters uh, who visited our booth and were, you know, just marveling at the the train model we had there, and and talking to them about being an engineer and going down that career path as something that uh, would be an exciting way for them to be able to utilize some of those hard skills and turn them into something that uh, really benefit the world, uh, building infrastructure and the like. Yes. So, you know, what what inspired you to become an engineer when you first were going down that path? Well, so my dad was in the military, and, and my mom and dad and six kids, we traveled all around uh, the world and lived in Italy and Germany, and we were never any place for longer than two or three years before we, we would pick up and go. So I'm uh, very proud of my, my dad and dad's military service. So I decided early days I wanted a life of adventure. So I don't talk about this much, but I was in one of the first classes of women that went to West Point. Um, women were first oh. admitted in West Point in 76, and I entered in 78, and I graduated in 1982 uh, with an engineering degree, and my, my first career, I should say, was as an Army helicopter pilot. And so uh, I, I did that for six years and, and loved it. Um, when I got out, I was back at Berkeley getting my master's degree. I was flying in the Army Reserves, mostly, mostly I have to say to pay the bills and to put food on the yeah. table. I was, <laughs> I was flying in the Army Reserves, and I, talked with a guy, and uh, Joe is his name, I remember, it was a really impactful conversation, and I said, you know, Joe, I just can't figure out what is gonna be my next incarnation of me. I have loved military service, I'm, uh, it's part of my, you know, service, and it's part of me. I, 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 don't, I don't know who I'm gonna be next. And he said to me, well, I know. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, no, he said, you should be in construction. And I said, well, why do you say that? And he said, well, because it's full of a lot of loud, robust people out trying to do what most people in the world think is impossible, usually in bad weather with great big toys. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I found my people. Um, and so I went knocking on doors and, and, and indeed got a job with Bechtel uh, shortly after that and, and have loved it ever since and have loved great big uh, projects that trans people's lives, transform cities and regions. Um, as an utterly cool way to make a living. So what other kinds of engineering disciplines are involved with a project like this? So loads, and you know, I'm happy that you saw me. I was recruiting five-year-olds, seriously. <laughs> uh, I can I, attest, I watched. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple reasons about that. I've, I figured out about 10 years ago, speaking in high schools and universities uh, uh, passionately about the great life of, of engineering, that I was too late that by the time young people are 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, most young people have a vision of themselves and what they, what they think they're good at and what they're, and, and m many, many, many times no one has ever said to them, how'd you like to be an engineer? Wouldn't it be great to be an engineer? This is the kind of thing that engineers uh, do. So I started to slowly shift my focus over the years, uh, younger and younger till, uh, especially if I see, you know, sort of, uh, groups of five-year-old girls, I go up and I'm going, yes, I can see you would all be great engineers and engineering needs you and needs your creativity and your energy and your strength and your vision of this world. Come be engineers. So I, I do that a lot. I often make whole classrooms of kids promise me they're all going to be engineers. <laughs> uh, I don't know what their parents think when they, <laughs> when they go home again, but I'm like, you have to, people, people as clever and amazing as you, you just have to be engineers because you're the people that are changing, going to change our world, and whether that's power systems or transport systems. But, but back to your question about what do we need. Well, the, the main engineers I need right now are geotechnical engineers. Really, you think engineers that run trains and drive trains? Nope, not me. I'm looking for people who understand what's the soil strata and what's the behavior of the earth beneath us to determine how deep do our foundations be. I need structural engineers because all of our big viaduct sections, they're like big, beautiful bridges, aren't they? And so they need not just structural stability, they need durability for the next hundred years. They need robustness in storms and, and uh, all kinds of Texas weather that I'm just learning about here in my, in my <laughs> two weeks since arrival. 
Um, uh, we, we need electrical engineers, of course we do, because we're going to be going out to get brand new power substations, which is a very long process of bringing electricity to our, to our trains. Mechanical engineers, of course, almost everything that we do from the track and the signaling systems and the switching systems all involve mechanical engineers. Our stations are going to be very beautiful and inspirational places because of our architects. But I've worked with architects my whole career, and it's only when you get it together and your architectural and your civil and, and your structural design go together beautifully to actually you get the kind of stations that you need. Inside the stations, everything from customer information systems to lighting to, to that, you know, escalators, elevators, transport systems, all of that go into making a, a, a great big, you know, viable, vibrant, desired uh, transport system. Well, I, for one, am so glad that we have people like you in position that you're in right now because that is all well above my pay grade. So thank you very much. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, somebody uh, who, who is able to bring in the inspirational message of what engineering can do to improve quality of life across the board. And, you know, so I guess, you know, zooming out from just this train in particular to just society at large, what does, in your view, what is the role that civil infrastructure plays for a city? Okay, um, that's a great question. So I think the two obvious answers are the benefits to the environment. So getting, you know, with 400 passengers in each one of our trains, that may not be 400 cars off the road, but if you look around, there's a lot of people alone in their cars in this country. I used to harass Australians about it, and I said, look, I feel free to harass you about looking across the road at terrible traffic congestion, seeing one person in every car, and I can, I can rudely say that because it's true in America and most places as well. So, so, you know, one is just the incredible environmental benefit of getting people with cleaner power, cleaner electric power onto being able to move. So, so environment environment, environment, which is such a, a critical topic. It also is economic prosperity, economic prosperity, not just to the people immediately around uh, and, and working on our system, of which there will be thousands, but all that spillover benefit of, of the other jobs that they then uh, uh, inspire and, and, and other communities that are able to prosper. I love that we in Texas Central have taken on board as well, that we need to care about small minority underrepresented businesses, women-owned businesses. You'll know that I'm, I'll be a massive proponent of that. So there's a, there's a whole economic prosperity thing that, that I'm proud that that's going to be at the core of what we're doing. But if you ask me what gets me out of bed in the morning, it's neither of those two things. It's the social justice aspect of, of what we do. And um, here I'll, I'll share a personal story. Um, I have two sons. I have two uh, I have a husband and I have two, two great sons. And my sons are 22 and 23. And my younger son, who is 22, is quite severely dyslexic, always has been since well, I've noticed it when he was two. Um, and that gives him a number of great gifts. Uh, anyone who is dyslexic will know that it allows you to see the world in a really, really different way. And he's got some amazing talents uh, that I would never, he would never trade, and I would, of course, never trade. But he also has created some complexities for him. And one of those complexities is not being able to drive. He might drive one day, um, uh, but right now that, that sequential decision-making piece of it has meant that he scared himself a few times behind the wheel of a car, and he's elected now at 22 years old not to drive. Well, he's currently living in Europe, although I'm trying to talk him to this side of the wow. ocean. But part of the brilliant thing of living in, living in London, where he is now, is he gets everywhere on the public transport systems. So he is able to have a very full life. He's in a university-level program right now very full and uh, life of seeing his friends and having a great quality of life because of public transport. And without public transport, he would be imprisoned as, as many people who are in wheelchairs or who are partially sighted or blind or for whatever other reason can't drive and are not wealthy enough to be able to afford Ubers wherever they go. And, and so it is, it's that aspect that I utterly utterly love uh, about what we do. And the other piece I'd, I'd add to that is just in my lifetime, I've watched uh, lifespans, life expectancy, just 
go kaboom, just kaboom. My dear father who passed away at 97 said to me, you know, honey, I, I don't know what happened. It used to be you got to be 60 and died. And uh, what, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> and, um, but you know, for his last 10 years of his life, he did not drive and lived in a place that did not have public transportation available to him. And I, and I watched how that, I'm, I hate to use that word, imprisonment of people. And, and so in thinking about my own father and thinking about life expectancies, I feel like as a people, we haven't really gotten our heads around that, that we have this huge population of people that is going to live well into their 90s, possibly 100, and very, very likely for that last 10, 15 years of their lives not be able to drive a car. And so, you know, as a people, as a, as a nation, we need to think about that and think about how we do things differently. And the time is now to get on with building our systems because they don't come about in a clap of a hands or in one year's time. Yeah, that's powerful. I have uh, my, both of my dad's parents uh, live in upstate New York and they're 95 and 98. And neither one of them have been able to drive for several years. So that, you know, that message resonates with me as well. It's important to, to give people that, that quality of life back to them when they lose the ability to be able to be mobile on their own. Yes, yes. And we owe it to them. Certainly. Well, Linda, do you have any fin final thoughts to share with, with our audience who, who are listening on uh, their whatever podcast listening device they are listening to? Well, um, well, I'm excited to be here. I'm learning to speak Texan. Uh, I learned to speak Australian, so I, I feel I'll be all right. Uh, <laughs> and just really thrilled to be here in, in beautiful, beautiful Texas. Well, if you're looking to reinvent yourself again, I think broadcasting may be for you. So thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys.